Hi, my name is Romain Guy, and I work on the Android Toolkit team. And today I would like to tell you about Jetpack Compose. So if you haven't heard about it, Jetpack Compose is our next generation UI toolkit written entirely in Kotlin to build high quality applications for Android easily and quickly. But the best way for you to understand what Jetpack Compose is and why it's different from the existing UI toolkit is to look at a little bit of code. So we'll start with this. Uh, it's a function. It has a single annotation called add composable. And that's pretty much all you need to create a new widget, what we call composables in the Compose world. You don't have to extend a class. You don't have to overwrite constructors or methods. You create a function or a method, and that's it. It can be private, public, whatever you want. It's just a function. So then, to actually generate a UI from that, you're going to take some input. So in my example, I want to uh, produce a label for a product. So I take my product as a parameter of the function. Once again, very simple, just a function. And from then on, I can uh, do what we call emit the UI. So I'm going to invoke another composable function. This one is one of the default composable functions that are part of Jetpack Compose. It's called text. It just creates a label on screen. And that text contains a string that's built from my product. One thing uh, that's interesting to notice is that composable functions can only be invoked from composable functions. So in that sense, they're kind of like suspend functions if you're familiar with coroutines. Add composable changes the type of the function, and you can only call them in the right context. One way to think about it is that your composables are just functions that take data and transform it into your UI. So your UI is a function of the data. And that's why we went this, with this function paradigm, not only because it's simpler to write the code, it's simpler to refactor, but it's also very easy to reason about. So we really want the data to flow down uh, from, from, your, from your business logic down to the, uh, to the functions. What's powerful about using Kotlin to write your UI this way is that you have access to all the features of the Kotlin language. So let's say, for instance, that we want to only display our label when the quantity of the product is greater than zero. We don't have to tell Compose how to do this. We don't have to do things like, OK, let's find this label. If it's visible, let's make it invisible. If it's not visible, let's make it visible, and so on. Instead, we just start compose what we want. And you can see the code on screen, it's super simple. I just say, OK, if the quantity is greater than 0, there's a label. Otherwise, there's nothing. And Compose will take care of everything else. And whenever the value of the product changes, Compose will reinvoke my composable. We call that recomposition. And we'll reevaluate that logic. And we'll take care of updating the tree as needed. So you don't have to worry about removing and adding the items. Compose does everything for you. And of course, this works in complex situations. Let's say here I have a for loop to create a column of labels. If the quantity updates for the product, the number of emitted items will change, but I don't have to do anything. Compose takes care of all of it for me. All right, one, thing, one last thing I want to talk about is state. So most of the time, you want to operate only on input parameters and hopefully immutable parameters to your function. But sometimes you want a bit of state. So here, I have a list of products. And I want the user to be able to filter the list based on something they type on a query. So to do this, I start by creating a state. This is just a string. And I can use this convenient function called state. And I can use it as a delegate. So it creates a state object that Compose will remember. We said that Compose memorizes it. Then I can create a text field. I can give the filter string as the initial value to display inside the text field. And the text field can also call a lambda whenever the user enters something inside it. So in that case, I supply a lambda to on value change. And inside that lambda, I will update the state. So whenever the user types something, my lambda is invoked. I update the filter. And Compose will trigger a recomposition, which will update the, the displayed value inside the text field. And then using that filter, I can go through the list of products and just display the ones that match the query. So once again, when the user types something into the text field, you know, a recomposition will happen and my loop will automatically re-execute. And that's all you have to do. Again, no callbacks, no cleanup, no setup, no listeners, nothing. You just describe what you want the UI to be, not how you want it to update. All right, so here's how text, uh, uh, Compose works. So there are two parts to Compose. First, on the development host, where you write your code. It starts with the Kotlin compiler. We use a lot of features of Kotlin's. For instance, training lambdas. You may have noticed them already in the examples. And even though we use an annotation, we don't use an annotation processor. Uh, Compose uses a compiler plugin. So it works at the, the, the type inference system, at the type system level, and also at the code generation level to do its magic. 
And then finally, we have Android Studio that you all know and love, and we have some Compose-specific tools inside of Android Studio. Now, on your device, we have the Compose Runtime. At its core, Compose doesn't know anything about uh, Android or UIs. It just works on trees. So we could actually emit other things than UIs with Compose. Then on top, we have the Compose UI core. That's your input management, measurement, drawing, layout. Then we have the foundation. That's your standard layouts like rows and columns and default interactions. And finally, we have Mature Design components. So we have an implementation of the Mature Design system. So if you use Mature Design in your application, everything that you need for Mature Design will be available out of the box with Compose. So let's take a look back at Compose so far. We announced it a year ago at IO19. Uh, we also then moved all the development into AOSP. Now, all the development is in the open. You can follow along and you can even contribute if you want. But it was only the source code. If you wanted to play with Compose, you had to build Compose yourself because we are not quite ready for prime time yet. A few months later, at Android Dev Summit, we announced the Developer Preview 1 of Jetpack Compose. So you could download the latest version of Android Studio and you could easily create new projects and start giving us feedback. And since then, many of you have done so and we've made major changes to Compose and we think that it's better than it's ever been. So please keep that feedback coming. So today, we are launching Developer Preview 2, and that's available right now on developer.android.com. So please give it a try once again. Uh, if you are, and if you haven't done so, like you will, you will be able to look at tutorials to learn Compose. Now, what's interesting is what happened between Developer Preview 1 and Developer Preview 2. Uh, we started doing bi-weekly releases. So I, th I believe we've done 12 or 13 uh, releases since then that some of you have decided to use. and. We want to thank you for your patience because we've made major API changes and you had to do a lot of refactorings in your test applications. But that gave us the ability to quickly iterate on the feedback you were giving us. And once again, Compose is that much better because of it. So today, I would like to take a look at some of the things we've done over the past few months and also address some of the questions that many of you have asked us when we first announced Compose. If you watched the Android 11 launch keynote this morning, You've already seen a demo where we presented some of the tools that we have for Jetpack Compose. If you haven't, you should watch that video, but if not, here's a quick summary in one screenshot. So in this screenshot, you can see the embedded emulator on the left. It helps you run your app side by side with your code. On the right, you can see a preview for Jetpack Compose composable functions. So as you make tweaks to your code, you can see the updates uh, in real time to your widgets with having, without having to rerun the app every single time. The preview can also be interactive, so you can even test the logic of your widget without running the app. Finally, those previews are available in the inline documentation. You can see that in the pop-up. So when you do code completion, for instance, you can see what the widgets, the composables look like. And we have many more ideas of what we want to do for the tools. So stay tuned, the teams are hard at work, so there is a lot more coming in the future. All right, so first, I want to talk about modifiers. So when we first launched Developer Preview 1 at ADS, modifiers were present, but they were not used that much. Uh, and also they were a bit confusing because what you could do with modifiers, you could also do with regular composables. For instance, padding used to be a composable. But we figured that using uh, padding, for instance, as a composable was creating too much nesting. So now we've moved a lot of features to modifiers. Modifiers decorate a single element. And those decorations can be layout parameters, metadata, or additional behaviors. But the best way to understand modifiers is to look at an example. So here I have an image. Uh, you can see at the top that I've created a state. Uh, it's a simple circular shape. And you can see I'm using a slightly different variant of the state function that we already saw. Uh, it uses uh, destructuring assignment to get not only the value, but also a lambda that we can use to modify the value. And you will see why in a little bit. So first, I use an image composable to display my image resource. And then I have a single modifier called size. It sets the width and the height. And you can see on the right what the image looks like with these fixed uh, dimensions. Then we can add a second modifier, padding. Now the image is inset within the bounds of the image composable. Then we can add a draw shadow modifier. So the draw shadow modifier is interesting because it, compo it, it is made itself of multiple modifiers. And you can see it clips the image. So here I'm using my circle shape from my state at the top to not only draw a circular shadow, but also to clip the content of the image to this circle. Then I can use draw border to draw a circular border. So I still use the same shape. I use one of the colors from my material theme, uh, but also I can stack multiple modifiers of the same type. So I can add a second border or even a third border. And already you can see that I have something that's much more interesting. We started with this very simple rectangular image. And now we have a shadow, we 
we have circular clipping and we have multiple, bo multiple borders. I can also make the composable interactive. So here I used a ripple, a material design ripple. So every time I, the user taps on the image, I will automatically get the nice ripple effect. The animation will be handled for me and it's just a one line modifier. I also use a clickable modifier to add interaction to my image. So in this case, I call my set shape lambda that was given to me by the state function to toggle back and forth between the original circle shape and this new cut corner shape. So now just using modifiers, I started from an image, a static image, and now I have this visually complex interactive piece of UI. And that was super easy to do. All right, one of the things that a lot of you have asked us about when we first announced Compose was what about recycle view? Or, you know, for folks like me who started a long time ago, what about list view? Uh, you called out, rightly so, that, you know, all of our examples were built without using one of the fundamental elements of Android applications that uh, we use every day on our phones. And that's this kind of recycler list. You can see on the screen, I have my demo where uh, in my app, my shopping cart is made of multiple items and I can scroll through them and uh, I have a re this recycling list of items. We start with a composable function. You need to take a list as an input. In my case, you know, I could take a simple Kotlin list or mutable list, but I'm using live data. We also provide support for RxJava and Flow. So when you use uh, live data or RxJava or Flow, you need to observe uh, the data stream as a compose state. And we provide extension functions called observe as state. You can see it in action here. I can, I call observe as state. I get back a state object here called products and I can pass the state to my adapter list. That's the name of the recycler view in Compose. And then using a trailing lambda, every time that the adapter list needs a new item or to replace an item, I can just uh, describe the UI I want to emit. So in my case, I will create a shopping cart item based on the product that I received as an input. And inside, I want a 3D model viewer for the nice 3D animations. And that's it. You don't need to write an adapter. You don't need to do anything more than that. Uh, as soon as the live data object changes, if the number of items in the list uh, increases or decreases, or the value of any of the items changes, we will automatically recompose everything, reinvoke your trailing lambda for the adapter list, and the UI will update. It's not more complicated than this. Constraint layout is one of our most powerful and most popular layouts. Um, and that was one of the, the main questions we got, well, again, when we uh, announced the developer preview one and, uh, and Compose at IO, you wanted to know what about constraint layout? How will this work in Compose? And that's actually a very good question. It stems from the fact that in Compose, because we use functions, you can't grab a reference to view. So how do you describe constraints between different elements? So I'm gonna show you how to use constraint layout with Compose. And we're gonna use this small example in the bottom right. Uh, that row the, at the bottom has a couple of buttons, this uh, decrease and increase buttons. Then we have some text, we have a little color swatch, and we have another label. So let's take a look at how it works. So first, in our composable, we create a constraint layout. And that constraint layout needs a constraint set. Those used to be defined in XML or in code, but now they are entirely in code. But because it's an object, you can, of course, make that a constant. You can pass it around. You can do whatever it is you want. Here, we're going to create it in line. So to create a new uh, constraint, use this tag function and you give it a tag. The tag can be anything you want. It could be a string, uh, in my case, just a regular Kotlin object. And in that tag, we can declare the constraints themselves. So in this example, for the first button, the decrease button on the left, I want to constrain the left edge to the left edge of the parent. And I also want to center it vertically. And then all that's left to do is emit the button itself. And to be able to map it to the constraint we just created, we use a tag modifier. So we just assign the tag to the composable and constraint layout will do the rest. Now, because tag returns a constraint as an object, we can use that as a reference in other constraints. For, so for the next button that goes to the right of our first button, we create a new tag. And for the left constraint, we just use the right edge of uh, the decrease constraint that we just created. And the rest is exactly the same. We create our button, we assign a tag, and constraint layout will match the constraint to the composable. What's really powerful about doing all of this from code is that you can add a little bit of logic. So if you, if we fast forward a little bit, you know, I've added the labels and I have this little color swatch, that little red dot that you see at the bottom. That red swatch is not visible in every item of my list. It only appears on some items. So then how do I align the last label to the right of that swatch if that swatch is not always there? So this is how you do it. I create a new constraint. And for the left edge, I say constraint two. And here I can enter a complex expression. So here I say, okay, if I have a swatch, I want to be constrained to the constraint of that swatch 
Otherwise, I want to use the constraint of the label that came before. So this is much more convenient than doing the equivalent using both XML and code. Another thing a lot of you have asked about is animations. So I want to show you how animations work with Jetpack Compose. On the screen right now, you can see some of the animations I've built into my demo. Whenever the user selects one of the items in the shopping cart, for instance, to select multiple of them to be able to delete them quickly, uh, I animate the, the radius of the different corners, I animate an overlay on top of the item, and I animate a little check mark. So let me show you how this works with Compose. So first, we're going to create state inside our item to track the, the selected state of the item. So once again, I use the destructuring assignment. So I've selected as my state value, and I have unselected my lambda to be able to change and update that value. Then at the bottom, I could use a toggleable composable function. Uh, this will just, you know, it's just a helper to be able to do this selection easily. So I give it the selected state as the value, and whenever the value changes, I tell it to invoke my unselected lambda. All right, then for the ripple effect, that's built in, so I don't have anything to do, just modify the ripple. Here's where things get interesting. To animate the radius of the different corners, all I have to do is use this animate function, and I pass it a value. And as you can see, that value is itself based on my selected state. So I say, if it's the item is selected, I want a radius of 48 dps for the top left corner. Otherwise, I only want 8 dps. So whenever the selected state changes, recomposition will happen, a different value will be passed to the animate function, and the animate function will take care of everything else. It will kick off the animation, picking up where you, where you left off. It's fully interruptible, and it's based on physics. So then, after calling animate, I have another state value that I can then pass to my rounded corner shape. I can just assign those values directly to the different corners, and that's it. You don't have to use any listeners, any callback. There's no setup, and there's no cleanup to do. It's that simple. Of course, like I said, by default, we use physics-based animations. You can use twin animations if you prefer, and there's a lot of things you can control uh, that I won't show you today. This is another example, you know, same concept, but this time to animate the alpha. So instead of passing the value to the radius of the, of the rounded corner shape, I just pass the alpha that I'm animating with the animate function. Uh, I pass it as a color uh, of the surface. All right, next up is interrupt. Uh, you can see here in the demo that I have this list of items, and in every item, there is a surface view to be able to render this complex 3D scene. They are also fully reactive, so whenever I click the swatch in the top uh, item of the list, you can see that the color of the 3D object updates in real time. And this is something that we really care about. Uh, we got really inspired by Kotlin. Kotlin is great because if you have your existing Java-based application, you can start adding Kotlin at your own pace. You don't have to rewrite the entire application. And we wanted to do exactly the same for Compose. When you want to adopt Compose, you can just add adding Compose bit by bit, a new screen, a new part of a UI, just however you want to do it, it's going to work. So let me show you how to put views inside of Compose. So we start by creating a new composable function. This is my 3D viewer. It takes my product as an input. Then I have a bit of state. A model viewer is just the, the 3D viewer itself. You don't really have to worry about what it is exactly. What's interesting is at the bottom, I call this composable Android view function, and I give it as a parameter a ID for an XML layout. That XML layout contains a surface view. When it's done inflating, Android view will invoke my trailing lambda. It will give, you, uh, give me a reference to the view that was inflated, and I can then cast it as a surface view. And from there, I can, I can create my model viewer and tell it to render into that surface view. Of course, to render the 3D animations, I need to be able to refresh the content of the surface view on every frame. So to do this, I can use onActive and onDispose. So onActive is going to be invoked the first time your composable is added to the UI tree if you want. This is a great place where you can do some setup. So in my case, I'm going to uh, set up a callback for the choreographer so I can get invoked on every frame every time the screen refreshes. Of course, when the comp composable disappears from the tree, I need to be able to stop that callback so I can use on dispose to do my cleanup. So when you're part of a recycling list, like adapter list, this is really powerful to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Now to react uh, to data changes, so when I change the color of the product, I can use on commit. So on commit takes as a parameter what I want to track. So I want to track my product itself. And in on commit, I'm just going to look up the 3D object in the scene and change its color based on the new value from the product. And that's it. It's really simple. If you want to use a map view, a camera view, a surface view like I showed you, or any type of view, 
you can incorporate them in your Compose UI just in this way. Last but not least, testing. Uh, this was also one of the first questions we got. So once again, in Compose, because you just invoke functions, you can't take a reference to the widgets. And we don't have the concept of ID, so you can't do a find view by ID. So in our example, how do we test, let's say, those two buttons to increase and decrease the quantity of the product in our shopping cart? So let's take a look. To do this, we use a concept called semant semantics. Um, semantics are a way to add metadata to the tree of composables. This is what we use, for instance, to drive accessibility, but this is also at the core of testing. So for instance, here in my example, in my shopping cart item, I use the test tag composable. This creates a semantic node that contains a tag. It's a way for me to identify that part of the UI. And you can see it just contains my button that I want to test. So once we have that semantic node, we can move over to the unit test. It's just you know a regular add test function. Uh, I create some test data. So I have a product, I have the quantity is equal to two. I also need to create my logic. So this is a lambda that will simply decrease the quantity by one every time the user clicks the button. Then I can set up my test UI. I just invoke my shopping cart item and then give it the data and the lambda I just created. Finally, here's the interesting part. I can use find by tag to find the part of the tree that we just tagged uh, inside our composable. And from then on, I can do a lot of things. I can query whether or not it's displayed, I can check its state, I can check a value, or I can perform actions. So here, I perform two clicks. And finally, at the end, I make sure that the quantity is now zero instead of two after two clicks. The best part is Compose is designed with testing in mind. So all those features come built in. You don't need something like Espresso, for instance. This run on idle Compose that you see that I use at the bottom is part of the default APIs. So that's it for today. That's, you know, everything we've been up to. Uh, well, of course, there's a lot more uh, over the past few months. But now I want to look ahead a little bit. So we are releasing Developer Preview 2 today. And later this summer, we are going to release our alpha release of Compose. For us, alpha is when you start adopting Compose inside your application. Some features might be missing. We have to catch up with 15 years of development in the existing APIs, after all. But there should be enough for most applications out there. Some of our APIs may still be experimental, and there might be a few changes uh, ongoing after alpha. But we really want to start playing with it and give us all the feedback that you may have. Because next year, we want to release Jetpack Compose 1.0. So if you haven't done so already, please visit developer.android.com slash jetpack slash compose. There you can find how to download and install the Developer Preview 2 with the latest version of Android Studio. You will find tutorials, code labs, and so on. You can also read the samples that we put on GitHub. And more importantly, you can come chat with the team on Slack. So if you join the Compose channel on the Kotlin link Slack, you will be able to talk with various members of the engineering team. Uh, this is a place where we gather a lot of your feedback. This has been immensely helpful to improve Compose in the past few months, and it's so much better than it was when we started. You will also be able to chat with the rest of the community, and everybody is incredibly helpful there. If you have feature requests or if you find bugs, as I'm sure you will, please use the issue tracker that's listed here. This is the same issue tracker we use, so we look at it all the time. Finally, if you want to see what's coming, you can look at all the changes that we made daily on AOSP at android-review.googlesource.com. Uh, you can just watch everything happening, and if you want, you can even contribute. So that's pretty much it for today, and I would like to thank you, all of you, for all the feedback that we, you've been giving us. Uh, but before I let you go, I just wanted to say that I've been working on Android for close to 15 years, um, and usually I do not use the word excited lightly when I give a talk, uh, but frankly, I don't think I've ever been as excited about the future of Android UI as I've pretty much ever been, or maybe on my first day on Android. So I'm really looking forward to what you're going to do with Compose. So please keep the feedback coming. Thanks. Mm -hmm.